thank you so much for coming. I am only going to be talking about my work in a kind of circuitous way because I had some other thoughts that I wanted to put on the table. But you can see that I have repeated a portrait pose. I got that pose from early American painting. I have a particular interest in colonial American portraiture. The colonial era is the starting point of our contemporary circumstance, economic, political, religious, and racial. It's the making of America, establishing what it is to be an American, and that process is made visible in early American portraiture. In studying the art of that period, I learned that one of the mezzotint engravings that served as source material for a number of early American depictions of women was this print by Isaac Beckett. It was a common practice for early American artists to use English prints as prototypes, in part because there really was not a arts inst uh, institutions here yet in terms of arts museums or arts academies. So artists would rely on uh, earlier depictions for understanding how they could make work. The English prints were often based on other pre-existing artwork themselves. So the Isaac Beckett print was actually based on a William Wissing portrait of Princess Anne. So this pose has a long lineage. Some of the early American artists that used it are John Singleton Copley and John Greenwood. I included a representation of John Greenwood's version in my painting here, which is called Close Quote with the Blue Fabric. That is a portrait of Elizabeth Welshman. The only thing that I know about her is that she is the she was the wife of a sea captain, and to have had her portrait painted, she would have been a woman of means. When I read Wayne Craven's book, Colonial American Painting, which is one of the central texts on the subject, I found myself uh, constantly looking for references to African Americans, to slavery, or to the labor and creative production of enslaved people. And there was almost nothing said of the role of black people in the building of this nation. And so it was that absence in some of the scholarship in part that compelled me to make this body of work. I wanted to share with you some of what I learned about the United States through doing the process of making this work, as well as share some of my reflections on the relationship between art and politics or art and social change. There's a lot of discussion right now about who made America, who belongs here, and in what way we should remember our past. I've been personally exploring how we became the nation that we are by looking at American history through our first attempts to render Americans in early American portraiture. And I was doing that work before the election, but certainly the uh, extreme racism and misogyny that the election amplified has given that uh, interest of mine a deeper significance. Some of what I've learned is that so much of what we deal with today was present at our origins during the colonial era. Criminalization and persecution of the poor, which in part came out of this idea, this belief that God's favor could be read through one's ability to accumulate wealth. A belief in the hierarchical superiority of races, the creation of an aristocracy from the winners of capitalism and religious justifications for violence. Those are part of our bedrock. Surprisingly to me, you can learn these things about America by looking closely at the ways Americans depicted themselves. Collectively, early American portraits create a narrative of religiously endorsed white male dominance, and an obsessive pride in wealth and ownership, including the ownership of other human beings. Viewed from the vantage point of our history, our current uh, political situation is not surprising. 
In terms of the role of art or the responsibility of the artist, I don't look to art for direct action. I don't need art to provide answers or solutions. What I do think art, in part through the study of art history, can do is provide a responsible way to examine the historical record, which is a way that we can better understand how we got here. In terms of what I make and what, how I see what I make as being a positive contribution, I am invested in a long, slow process of gaining the skills and knowledge I think I need to be able to produce work at a high degree of excellence. I believe that excellence in any field and with any content, whether it's a Neil deGrasse Tyson or Misty Copeland, offers a counter-narrative. We assert and make visible everything of which we are capable. That's what I'm working towards. My work has gone through many shifts over the years, but it has always been about creative capacity and weaving negatives into positives. The holes in the history, the gaps in the scholarship, and the fact that there is so much to oppose right now, from my point of view, those things for artists are opportunities. The counter-narrative that my work offers is a woman of color at the center of and controlling a discourse on painting. Now, that's not a narrative that's going to have a direct impact on people's lives. It's not direct action. It's reflective action. When I made uh, this painting, which is titled Sales Slip with the Red Fabric, I was listening to the audiobook The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism, which is a book that I recommend every American read. So by painting a woman of color, a black woman, into this colonial era pose, I'm inevitably entering this territory of slavery, the commodification of the body, as well as the ownership over image production, who does the representing, who is represented, and in what manner. In my works, my subject is the model, the maker, the owner, the agent, and the seller. My, um, the implications are not only related to slavery in terms of the relationship to the market, place, but that is one line of interpretation. Going back to the Isaac Beckett and the John Greenwood portrait, this image of a woman sort of passively fondling a string of beads, that was symbolic of wealth and vanity. In my painting here, the yellow painting titled Birthright, I too make a display of wealth and vanity, but here in a painting about freedom. So she's wearing gold jewelry as well as a, a pendant painting necklace with the image of the Hindu god Hanuman. In her hand, she's holding, uh, well in her lap, she's holding a, a family heirloom, which is a scrapbook that my great great aunt put together in the 1920s. Photography gave African Americans of earlier generations a way to produce images that countered the prevalence of negative imagery. The photograph that my subject is holding is one of the photographs that I found in the uh, scrapbook that my great aunt put together. And I don't know who she is or how she might be related to me. All I know is that on the back of the photograph it says Aunt Gertie. What I wanted to present was her apparent pride and self-possession. I added a floating element behind her, uh, which is based on or reminiscent of the windswept fabrics you occasionally see in early American portraiture, and that it was symbolic of a free spirit. To further echo this theme of freedom, I used a faster brushstroke and a more liquid uh, paint, and I left a little bit of the painting not quite complete, so there's a sense that it is coming into form. In all of my work, I am establishing multiple levels of meaning. I'm 
speaking to my interest in history while also making hopefully something that has contemporary relevance. I'm employing a naturalistic painting style at the same time that I'm emphasizing the underlying abstract structure of the work. And I'm presenting my own exploration of what it is to be a person of color in America while at the same time trying to move the genre of self-portraiture away from identity and towards a discourse on painting. To me, painting, it's mechanics, it's history, uh, it's practice, is the lens through which I look at pretty much everything. Thank you. I'm happy to hear your thoughts or answer any questions. I have a, one of my eyes is a lazy eye, so um, I'm going to do that. Um, I thought it was interesting just how you talk about how um, the early American portraiture and the conventions of who was represented and how it reflects mm -hmm. the culture and social values of the people making it. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, is there anything that's distinctively American in that, or to what extent does that reflect the conventions of European painting at the same time? Right, that's so interesting because so one of the things that really excites me about colonial American portraiture uh, is that it's a kind of distillation of the figurative painting tradition, in part because of the way that the artists were looking to uh, and using uh, European prints and pre-existing images for their work. So is there something distinctly American about it? Well, what's interesting is that since the artists born here and practicing here didn't have the same uh, infrastructure, arts infrastructure, and all of the resources of education, there's a, a very different paint handling, a very different relationship to, um, to realism. So you'll, if you look at the European tradition, there's much more of a idealization happening. And in American painting, it's sort of take me as I am. And that's partially because of an American spirit, you could say, or psychology, and partially because the, uh, the, the artists were working purely from a kind of observational painting method as opposed to, you know, oh, this is how you, you know, make the skin tone look so, um, you know, whatever, like so, so clean or something, so. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, maybe you said this, over what time period have you made all these paintings? So these three paintings are the most recent paintings here, and I really made them as a group. Um, so when we first were, you know, uh, when we first had the studio visits from the Walters folks, this one was here, and I made these two since then, so that happened really, really quickly, like in a month and a half which is way faster than I usually work. So the works on that side of the room are all from 2016. The works from this side of the room are all from 2017. So it can take me anywhere up to two months to make a work. And sometimes I get lucky and it happens faster. Yeah. Nikki, did you take pictures of the Yes, I do work from uh, photographs that I take of myself. I think about the that process as almost a kind of uh, solo performance, and uh, and then I work through preliminary drawings to uh, you know uh, figure out the final compositions. Yeah. Could you say something about the meaning that the rotation and the blue velvet holds for you? Well, it's funny because in one way I think about this this uh, exhibition as a kind of visit to my studio while, um, while I'm working. I do a lot of things in the studio besides paint. My studio is quite small and I'm constantly shuffling paintings around. I have to turn them on their side to get them out the front door because um, my paintings are quite, you know, fairly large. So in part it was actually just literally the painting was already in that position and I started, um, you know, playing around with the parts, moving things around. And I just got, I got very interested in having, you know, you'll see that I often have my subject return the gaze of the viewer. And I got interested in having the, 
the gaze of the figure at the bottom of the painting, of the painting within the painting, returning the gaze of the viewer, as opposed to the you know um, figure pulling the blue fabric. So it doesn't exactly answer your question, but. Well, no, it does. It does. Thank you. I'm interested in the order of the paintings chronologically. Can, do you recall which you did first, second, third, and? Um, so they are actually basically in order. So, oh, okay. Uh, except that this was this is the most recent painting. So sure. if you just swap these, these two. then okay. they're in order. Okay. I'll also be sticking around a little bit if anybody has any other questions or I've got it.